Railroad Preserver 2000 here back again doing another Stormworks recording and I am currently on board the work in progress MS Sapelo. Um, this is the first new ship on the fictional JNR line since the MS Tybee and it's taken nearly a year in real time to build. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief tutorial on how to start it up in case people who have the model later on don't know how to start it up. Understand that this model is still work in progress at this time, so a lot of what you see and a lot of what is shown may still be changed. And if anything more technical gets changed, I will do an updated tutorial to help with any questions anyone might have. So, to start off, we're going to push the throttles on the bridge to their full position port and starboard. Then, using no clip, I'm going to go down to the fuel tank room, which is through these doors here, and I'm going to push the fuel valves to their full pos open positions, and the pipe pressure for each of the fuel lines is about two, so there's nothing to really worry about there. And for audio's sake, I'm going to mute my computer so that you guys can hear me talk here. So next, once you're in the engine room, you're going to want to turn on the port and starboard engine fuel pumps, and then followed by turning the RPS selectors to their full posi up positions. This is to help with the startup procedure. Then what you're going to want to do is turn the engine starter keys which are here and here for the port and starboard engines respectively and here's also the backlight button in case you're curious fuel tank gauge is in the center so I'm going to unmute the sound so you know what to listen for I will warn you though this will be loud so I apologize for anyone who has sensitive hearing so, turning the keys to engage the port engine startup. That's the engine clutch in the reverse. I'll deal with those in a minute. As you can hear, the engines are slowly turning over. And for the gauges, you've got knots here, pipe pressure, RPS, engine temperature, generators, battery, etc. All right, port engine has started. Oh, and also, you're going to want infinite fuel and electric off. Now, the starboard engine has started. So once they've started up, now is the time for you to hit the engine clutch down here. This turns the engines on to where they start generating power for the generators. Now this is going to gradually increase before slowly going down to a set level. See, it goes into the 50s and slowly pulls back to about 53 to 40 something percent in terms of its output. But it's enough to charge the batteries. So, now that everything's up and running, what you'll then want to do if you're deciding to use no clip while using the model is to simply push both of the outboard clutches to their full upward positions. And well, off you go. And bear in mind, with infinite fuel on, the speed is going to mostly remain the same. Without infinite fuel, the ship's speed is about 47 knots. That's usually where it caps out. It does go to 50 briefly, but as you can see, it gradually hangs out at 47 knots, and that's where it usually stays. So... Now that the engine startup procedure has been um, attended to, now is the time to show the safety features. So here's where I'm going to mute this. 
Okay, now that the ship is up and running, I'll go and tell you now it has two sinking features, a bow sinking and a stern sinking. When you engage the sinking for the stern, it ends up blowing up the engines and setting them on fire. So, there's a fire suppression button here on the left side of the panel, and it's the second button on the second block level here. You want to engage this and leave it engaged for maybe at most 45 to 50 seconds just to make sure any fires in the engine room are extinguished. This system was recently expanded to also put any fires out that may occur in the generator room. So you'll want to engage that and the fire suppression system would should be working. And I'll no clip into the engine room to show you. Okay, so as you can see by the particle effects, the fire suppression is working both in the generator room and engine room respectively. So once that has been engaged enough to, long enough to put out any fire, you'll want to disengage this and engage the watertight doors. Now, there are five watertight compartments, so there's well, there's technically five to six watertight compartments, but five doors. And you can close them individually from here on the bridge electrically and also open and close them manually via levers down on the bottom deck, which I will show in a minute. However, if the situation is in a, a genuine emergency where the flooding is occurring very quickly and you need a rapid response, you need to turn this key here. It's the fourth key on the right side of the panel. This is the watertight door override switch, and when you hit this, it will activate, as you can see, all the watertight doors and shut them in the full closed position, as you see here. To disengage the override from the bridge, you just need to unlock the handle, or the key, excuse me, which, of course, is turning it off, and then re-engaging it, opens all the doors. But in this case, I'm going to completely shut all the doors and I'm going to show you how to unlock all of them via the manual method. Now this is in case, God forbid, the ship loses power or you lose electricity for some reason. So, starting with watertight door number one here in the ship's cargo hold, you'll find a lever here alongside the door. As you can see, there's a light on that indicates the door is closed. The light above is a general alarm light. These are for to indicate a general alarm emergency, as well as fire, flooding, or that the doors are closing, or a mixture of all three, which is, of course, a worst-case scenario. Anyways, what you're going to do once you're down here, if the doors are shut and you have need to open one or two to get to things, you're going to want to hit the lever here, let it turn a few rotations, and as you can see, turn it on this side, it opens the door. If you turn it on this side, or either side for that matter, it closes it. So as you can see, the door is now closed, and if I hit this again, it opens. And in order to close it again, you just stop the handle, spin it again, and there you go. Now it's locked. And in the machine shop, you'll find various welding torches and whatnot. Um, once I get the up-to-date version of the model back, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip all this cosmetic detail out and change the shelving to have more equipment, mostly underwater welding torches, respectively, because... This ship needs a lot if you're going to try and save it, and I have done that. A friend and I partially sank the ship, beached it, repaired the damage, pumped it out, and managed to save it. But in real time, it took about four to five hours. And that's if you have another person with you and are able to work quickly enough to repair the damage enough to slow the flooding and allow the bilge pump system to get ahead, which is what we're going to review next.
So, now that you've gotten the doors closed, you'll think, oh, the water shouldn't be able to move throughout the ship. It'll stay afloat. For the stern sinking, unfortunately for you, that's not the case. The stern sinking is designed to slowly and deliberately sink the ship and bypass the bulkheads via a system of vents. But that's to make the sinking more interesting. With the bow sinking, however, if the damage can be contained or even repaired, theoretically, you can keep the ship afloat. It'll be low in the water, but it'll be able to be kept afloat, unless you open doors. But, in the case that that compartment is flooded, which is the forward cargo hold, you'll want to try and engage these pumps. Now, this is what this center damage control board is. In between the map table and the radar, which is here and here, you'll find a set of six switches each. The top set is labeled bilge pump, C, compartment, meaning compartment, C1 or compartment 1, all the way to compartment 6. Turning these on will turn on all the bilge pumps within those compartments, as you see here. <clears throat> These red lights blinking here are simply blinking on to indicate that there is no water and so that the bilge pumps aren't drawing any water. The switches below the main pumps are for the auxiliary bilge pumps, which jettison water out through the bottom of the ship. Some of the pumps pumping rates vary, but the ones on the bow have been, um, from what I've seen, have been able to pump out roughly about 58 to sometimes 74 liters of water. And there's more than one pump. And these gauges here on the back show the bilge pump's pressure to indicate how much water is pumping out. As you can see, due to a, some sort of invisible flooding glitch, these two have been made to be kept active. None of us know what's causing the glitch, but these are pumping out water that isn't really there. In terms of the gauges, these show each of the compartments and, turn, and let you know how much water is coming into each as well as how fast. The red dials indicate how much water is flooding in. And then this, this here is the general alarm. Granted, that needs to be made louder, but... That's just a stand-in alarm. I'm hoping somebody I know who's good at logic and whatnot could put a better one in. But anyways. Engaging this will also engage those lights you saw above the watertight doors. They will blink in sequence with the alarm to more or less indicate, hey, something's wrong, you need to evacuate the area. Now, for my favorite part. And I have to turn it to night for this. Now this brings us to the emergency lights. So say you lose power due to the engine explosion and due to the fact that the generator room will also end up flooding in this stern sinking. I intend for later on for the ship to have a mass power failure because of it. But fear not! Even if you lose the main grid, there is an emergency backup circuit which is able to be engaged right here. So on this part of the panel, it is the third button down, level with the gauges. If you hit this, it will engage amber emergency lights throughout the ship, on deck, and in various public spaces throughout the vessel. There's not a lot of them, but there's... And in truth, they're there more for function. They're not there to help light the ship as brightly as the main grid. They are only there to help you be able to find your way out. And there's also exit signs that are also hooked to this circuit that light up as well when the switch is activated. So, once you've engaged the emergency lights, now comes the part of working the lifeboats. This is still a system that has also had a bunch of changes made after the original rendition of the model. So, 
As a result of this, I'm going to give a brief tutorial on the lifeboats. So I'm going to turn it back to day. And now that it's back to day, what I'm going to do here is hit the throttle lever here. And what this will do is it will swing the davit, which you can see is on, on the rails above us here. It will swing it out as seen here. And that'll put the lifeboat more or less out to the side. Once that's done, what you're then going to want to do is turn the key here, which will disconnect the magnet holding the boat in place. And of course, I have physics detail set to low, so let me change it to high and let the thing settle down. I'm also going to turn vehicle damage off because this thing is spazzing like crazy. So as a result of this, you're going to want to winch up in case the boat decides to have a exorcist moment because of it getting stuck as you see. So then what you're going to want to do is winch down and depending on if the boat doesn't get stuck like you see here, usually it, you can launch it without any genuine problems, but seeing what I'm seeing here is making me seriously consider redesigning the entire lifeboat system because this is an actual problem because the boat is getting stuck, which is not good. Okay, I'm going to have to make sure that gets changed now. But, in a perfect world where this thing doesn't get stuck, like so, you can usually launch these fairly easily, but as you can see, the ship is currently still moving. So, in light of this, what you're also going to want to do is stop the engines. And of course, what you're going to do there, and what I recommend doing to prevent them blowing up again, if you're somehow able to repair them, of course, is to pull the throttles back, all the way back to their full position. Once they're back, pull the clutches back on the bridge, both of them. This won't stop the engines or shut them down, but rather it will just stop the ship. If you turn them up a bit though, you can theoretically use the engines as makeshift generators to keep the uh, engines running. But of course, from what I've found, that's when you have the RPS and clutch on the engine room panel set to a very specific set of numbers. And that was what I did mainly to save the ship from sinking due to its pump system slowly losing power. Anyways, now that the ship is stopped, now you can proceed to disconnect the lifeboat. Which, as you can see here, is still dangling. So what I'm going to do is winch down, and what I'm going to do is also go into photo mode to show more or less um, how far you need to lower it down to. And as you can see, it's more or less in the water. So, once the boat is firmly in the water, this is when you're going to want to stop winching down. And if you decide to no clip or jump, I recommend no clipping because it keeps the boat more stable. Then you're going to go, want to go and disconnect the ropes. Now I got to get rid of this torch. So what you're going to want to do is hit disconnect the ropes and store them in the installed lockers. That way in case you either need to lash lifeboats together or hook them up to say a vet rescue craft davits, you can do so. Which is a pretty smart and pretty recent feature I must say. Also in the lifeboats are a flare gun, standard flare and flare gun ammo as well as med kits and about three compasses. 
All told, there's two flare guns, two flares, two boxes of flare ammo, three compasses, and six med kits. So, in terms of all the technical stuff and safety stuff, I believe this more or less uh, concludes the tour, or excuse me, tutorial on Sapelo as it currently stands. And as I stated before at the start of this recording, the um, tutorial will be updated if anything technical on the ship is updated. So, with that, I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope this will help later upon this ship's public release. If any of you still have questions, even though I gave a full tutorial, please feel free to let me know as to what the questions are, and I will do my best to answer them as well as I can. So, with that, this is Railroad Preserver 2000, beside the work-in-progress MS Sapelo, signing out.